OK, well, let's begin our international news review with an FT exclusive. Its own investigation uh, has revealed how the Islamic State group is generating up to half a billion dollars a year from oil in Iraq and Syria. This, of course, despite U.S.-led airstrikes and now Russian ones on IS-controlled territories. The Guardian features the British nurse, Pauline Kafaki, who has been readmitted to hospital in London after suffering further complications after contracting Ebola while treating patients in Sierra Leone. On to the business section of China Daily. It's reporting that Google could be quietly returning to China after some of its map services were partially accessible again in Beijing on Wednesday. The Companies and Markets section of the FT looks at why the world's largest retailer, Walmart, is being hit hard by competition from online retailers such as Amazon. South China Morning Post has a warning for Hong Kong. Get ready for more visitors from mainland China because uh, it says central government officials are considering relaxing restrictions uh, for mainlanders traveling on their own. And finally, The Telegraph says tourists and thieves who've taken relics from the ruined Roman city of Pompeii have been returning them to the site after claiming their lives have been cursed ever since. That's like the Roman Tutankhamun. Linda Yu is he, mm -hmm. fellow, Linda Yu even, fellow of economics <laughs> at Oxford University, professor also at the London Business School. Nice to see you, Linda. Good morning, Linda. This Good is morning. incredible, isn't it? Because you would have thought that actually, with the bombings, Mm. Oil would have been targeted because it's it's already known that it's a major source of revenue. But yeah. is it a significant amount, 500 million for the market rather than for ISIS itself? And for the market, it's substantial, but not a significant amount. But for ISIS itself, I mean, one and a half million dollars generated every day, that's pretty substantial. And I think quite a lot of the strikes by the U.S. and the coalition were intended to disrupt their cash flow. Because one of the extraordinary things about IS is that they have this cash flow that enables them to finance themselves. So I think what's really troubling is that the airstrikes are really not able to hit the kind of guerrilla-like refining operations that they have. And I think that's going to be a real challenge. What was fascinating also, I thought, in the story was what you can do about it. If you can't actually hit the targets to disrupt their cash, can you flood the market with cheap oil instead? Can you do other things to disrupt their cash flow? Also as well, what I found quite fascinating was who's buying this yeah, oil? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, kind of where it's going. It says so it's internal, of course. It is, Indeed, yeah. a lot of it's an internal market, but also as, as well they're supplying to non-ISIS groups in Syria or northern yeah. Iraq because yeah. it's cheaper? Yeah, and I think that is one of the um, difficulties of trying to penetrate. So one of the strategies for the coalition might be to try to supply cheap oil, but how do you get into a territory which is controlled by IS? I just don't think that's... Uh, it's not easy to do, but indeed, the internal market is absolutely huge in northern Iraq and Syria. Um, but. I just think this is just another reason why it's going to be uh, difficult for the coalition um, in terms of uh, success there. You know, we put Pauline Kafka's story and her suffering further complications after mm. having been apparently cured of Ebola as our yeah. second story because of the other story that's linked to this and mm. the study in Sierra Leone that found that actually Ebola can survive in people who have been basically shown to have recovered, but it can survive for nine months. In it's men. just laying dormant yeah. Yeah. at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah, that's really troubling. So apparently this is the first case where somebody who had been given the all clear has actually now relapsed and she's now critically ill. And I think it raises some real questions about uh, other countries which have been cleared from Ebola. So if you think about West Africa, there's a lot of countries there which had really suffered during the epidemic, but then had come through. And I think um, the story mentions there Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea where um, you already have very fragile health services. Can they mm. cope if this virus can actually relapse like it has? So I think quite a lot of people will be concerned for this nurse uh, beyond the obvious reasons of humanitarian. Absolutely. Now, this story uh, in the business section of China Daily talking about Google trying to reappear in, in mainland mm. China, this after its decision to, to move out some five years ago. Yeah. In that five-year period, some, you know, Homeland equivalents of Google have come up yeah. and they're very, very strong players, aren't they? I mean, Google has really been out of a very important market for quite some, 
quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one big mail-in player is Baidu, the Chinese search engine. Mm -hmm. Now, Google has kept its R&D facilities, but removed its search uh, facilities in China because you have to self-censor because of Chinese There was a lot of interference, basically. It couldn't yeah. do what it likes to do. And... Exactly. So they decided they were going to pull out and reroute through servers in Hong Kong. But in the last few years, there have been a huge growth in mobile apps. And they've teamed up with Huawei, which is the world's biggest telecoms company, also trying to break into mobile phones. And we know that apps generate a lot of traffic mm -hmm. and business. So it sounds like there's some reports here in the Chinese press that you're able to access Google applications again within China, suggesting that it's maybe chi uh, China's too big a market for Google just to step away from on principle, which it's hard. I know that was the debate they had before, but if you look at how these Chinese companies, sometimes that we're talking about, are also going overseas, it's not just a question of competing for China anymore in many ways. Mm. It's also a question, are they competitive against the newcomers um, globally? Because Baidu is going to go global, Huawei is already global. But how much would the Chinese government even bother about Google because mm. of this interesting little snippet here in the article that Xi Jinping, when he was in the United States, he met uh, LinkedIn's uh, co-founder, he met uh, Mark Zuckerberg, of course, of mm. Facebook, he met Apple's Tim Cook. Mm. He didn't meet anybody from Google. And we don't know whether that was Google saying, we don't want to meet the president or the mm. president mm. saying, look, I'm not really worried about meeting those guys. Yeah, I think, especially for something like search, language ability is absolutely critical. How competitive Google was before they left is a really good point, because they weren't really. Sure. Um, a lot of Chinese companies much better supplying Chinese language-based search facilities to their own people. Um, but that being said, the uh, Chinese market, a recent statistic suggests that China has now more middle-class consumers than even the United States. Yeah. And remember, yeah. China has the more billion people to go. So I think it's going to be one of the, be interesting to see if this really comes to fruition and Google actually ends up going back. Now give us your thoughts on, on Walmart. Um, a, a bit of a shocker, it came out with, with bad earnings but also a projection mm. for next year which is which was unexpected as well. Yeah. Shares really hit hard. Yeah. How worrying is this, do we think? I think this is symptomatic of a mm. wider trend, which is online competitors and Google, is, um, Google Amazon, Amazon <laughs> is really competitive. Now, Amazon did something very similar to booksellers. So if you look at the bookseller market, they completely dominated that space in a short period of time. And Walmart is now feeling the pinch as well, because Amazon, we now know, sells everything from groceries to housewares. And online competition is going to make it harder for bricks and mortar stores with higher costs in order to compete. And I think that's exactly Exactly what you're seeing in terms of and Walmart. also as well of course Walmart has had to promise its staff in the United States and that's a lot of people yeah. something like ten dollars an hour there's this whole protest mm. movement going on in the US about the living wage it should yeah. be about fifteen dollars an hour Walmart being you know one of the biggest employers there had yeah. to sort of give it give ground there but that that's a big cost isn't it if you suddenly have yeah. to increase the pay of everyone that works for you yeah you do, it is indeed and I think one of the issues one what, what I find about uh, interesting about online retailers is that they still have distribution centers they should be subject to the same pressures in terms of a minimum wage a living wage but they can be more globally mobile and I think that's mm. an advantage they do have over uh, bricks and mortars but that being said I think this is one of the big trends to watch and I wouldn't rule out um, online stores becoming offline which is the other trend because there's still something tangible about walking into mm. a store and touching something and seeing something. So and just taking it away with you and not exactly. having to stay at home for a delivery and all that kind of shenanigans. Yeah, yeah, we all know that too. Walk That's away. all coming with Christmas on the way. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay, uh, Simon, who's directing us, Linda, let's go uh, skirt over the uh, Hong Kong tourism. Yep. Uh, just to say that the Chinese central government is looking at relaxing rules for people not traveling on their own, but without the guidance and help of a tour group. That's what we meant by on their own, not with a tour group. Pompeii, yeah. you like this story. That yeah. Apparently, if you take something from Pompeii, the ancient Roman city, you get bad luck. Oh, yes. Lots of people from around the world, apparently, now regret having taken a stone. But my favorite part of this story is the British woman whose parents took the stone, who then felt guilty about it and then went and returned it. And I actually think this says quite a lot about social capital and trust. So whether or not you get cursed, leaving that aside, <laughs> I think there's something about the way that we see ourselves as a community. And I think there's something really lovely about the story. They're returning the stones well, with little notes of apology. That's apparently. right. That's what the archaeological yeah. superintendent with a post -it Stuck on it, saying sorry. <laughs> well, if you think about the history of Pompeii, you want to please the gods, basically. Indeed. <laughs> no. I don't yes. know if that's enough. Oh, you gods. Thanks, Linda. Thank you very much indeed, Linda. Great to see you. <laughs> bye bye. Back with more. Have very a lovely shortly. day. Bye bye.